Kanaka Rajan from Mount Sinai now. Uh, she was a graduate student at Brandeis in Columbia and happened to share a lab space with me for five painful years. No, they weren't painful at all. Um, and uh, she then went on to do postdocs at Princeton University, first with Bill Bialik, uh, then with David Tank. And she finally became uh, her own boss, I think about a year and a half ago now. Uh, and we're very excited to hear her speak about learning and maladaptive and adaptive strategies uh, thereof in recurrent networks. So without further ado, thank you very much, Kanaka. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation, especially to Panos and Tim for putting it together, Andrew, obviously. Um, I think this, you know, in, in these trying times, it's the best we can do to stay alive and sane. And so I really appreciate going the extra mile to make it possible to be, you know, much more inclusive to those of us who are, you know, uh, facing challenging times. Um, and so um, with, before I dive into my talk, um, I'd like to thank the key players um, in this project, uh, Matt Perrick, my postdoc, Camille and Jean, who are also in my lab and worked on this project with me. Um, all the experimental data that I'll be talking about today that inspired all of the modeling work came from the Dyseroth lab. And so I'd like to thank Carl for his largesse and his uh, you know, mentorship and advice and all of the above. And um, also Tyler Benster and Aaron Andelman who are in the Dyseroth lab. I would also like to thank our funding sources uh, for their faith and faith and you know their continued support um, of our ideas. Um, so in life, you know, when we select actions to perform, or you know, when we have to choose among a menu of behaviors, then we have to constantly evaluate whether these actions are worth the effort, right? So this morning I had to figure out, well, Tim's organized neuro theory world. Uh, is this, you know, a worthwhile effort? Now, if this goes well, if the actions yield are, are, or if the actions are fruitful, then you know your view of the world, whether you're optimistic or, or you know, in the in the um, in the converse, pessimistic, are often driven by our history with how fruitful these various actions have been. So, you know, you can become quite despondent if these actions repeatedly fail to yield fruit. Now, in the extreme, this kind of despondency or disappointment or pessimism can start to look like hopelessness, which, you know, a lot of, you know, postdocs should resonate with. In fact, kind of all of us are he heading a little bit, um, tending towards this um, at the moment because, you know, we've, the world has never faced something like this before. Now, hopelessness is also a key marker of uh, certain men neuropsychiatric illnesses such as depression. Hopelessness, importantly for the purposes of today's talk, is a, is a phenomenon that is seen in many animals with, uh, with different underlying, you know, neuroanatomies and different nervous systems. So, and it's also studied in many experimental preparations. And so the one that I'm showing you right now is called the force swim paradigm, where a rodent is placed in a little uh, small tank of water with no purchase. And it is supposed to escape this stressful or adverse um, environment. So initially when the mouse finds itself in this, um, in this mouse or rat for that matter, finds itself in this, in this force swim paradigm, it initially exhibits a vigorous response of the tail. And so it whips its tail and also makes a vigorous swimming response. And then eventually over time, this declines and the mouse almost, or the rodent gives up. So this initial phase of actively thrashing or avoiding this aversive or stressful um, phenomenon or, or stress that it is experiencing is called the active coping phase. And later on in the paradigm, when the animal sort of gives up or looks like it has learned to be hopeless, that is called passive coping. Now, active and passive coping both exist on ends of a behavioral spectrum. Now, this is an adaptive mechanism, right? It's an adaptive mechanism to conserve effort expenditure and so forth. But if passive coping occurs earlier than in the adaptive case, then such situations can be maladaptive. 
and therapeutic approaches such as ketamine have been shown to dilate the onset of passive coping. Now, mouse neurobiology in passive coping and similar states is an extensively studied field, as you can see from, from both the cartoon that I put up and the, and the sheer volume of references that come out. So I would like to draw your attention to two small things here first. One is the habenula and the other is the raffae. Those, those are the key players that I will keep returning to in my talk, but those are also regions that have been known to be significantly involved in the transition between behavioral states, such as active coping and passive coping. And that's going to be the focus of my talk. Now, mouse neurobiology, while it's extremely rich, has a few issues such as access, right? I mean, one difficulty, even with current neurotechnologies that we have, is the inability to monitor large parts of the mouse cortex in extremely long-term behaviors such as this. And so enter a nervous system with more access. And so larval zebrafish system is a beautiful system in that it is, while it is much smaller by orders of magnitude relative to the mouse, you can actually see through the whole thing and potentially record from every unit in the, in the fish while the fish is performing an array of behaviors potentially over long terms. Interestingly, from our perspective, the larval zebrafish system also has homologies with the mammalian system. And that's what I'm showing you here in this cartoon, particularly highlighting the habenula and the raffae again. And so there's a lot of papers that have, you know, uh, worked on, on these, uh, these types of questions, but, but a big research question or direction in which my lab likes to proceed is um, what circuit mechanisms are conserved and well, which ones are different when you go from a smaller nervous system with a lot of access uh, where you kind of don't have the sampling problem to a larger nervous system uh, with probably richer behavior repertoires, but where you have this problem where you can at any time point only um, access a fraction of the nervous system. So what circuit mechanisms are conserved when you go from a smaller nervous system to a larger nervous system, such as from the fish to the mouse to the, uh, the non-human primate to humans? And which ones are different? Both of these questions are tremendously interesting to me as a theorist, but for the perspective of uh, from the perspective of today's talk, I'd like to narrow this down to this one question, which is what circuit changes or mechanisms mediate the state transition from active coping to passive coping in the larval zebrafish? Now, to get at this question, I'm leaning on the experimentalist again. So Aaron Andelman in the Dyseroth lab developed this behavioral challenge paradigm where head-fixed larval zebrafish are, um, are subject to um, mild electrical shocks, about 1 to 1.3 milliamps, at roughly 1 a second-ish for a period of time. So when these shocks first come in, the, the, the larval zebrafish exhibits a violent whipping of the tail, a vigorous whipping of the tail to escape this unexpected um, shock or adversity. Now, if these actions, namely the tail whipping, are repeatedly fruitless because the fish can't escape because you know the shocks keep coming no matter what the fish does, eventually over a period of time, it looks as like though these stresses take on the quality of a persistent and inescapable stress, eventually the, the fish lapses into a, re, of, into a behavioral state in which its movements are significantly suppressed and it enters this uh, passive coping state. And so that's what I've shown you in this simplified uh, schematic here. I'm showing you an active coping phase and a passive coping phase as a function of this challenge paradigm. Now, while the, while the animal is, uh, is experiencing this behaviorally, the Dyseroth lab is also able to track the tail trajectories of the fish in real time. And so that's what I'm plotting here is the, is the velocity of the tails um, average across fish as a function of time. In, in very light pink, as I hope you can see, is sort of the initial phases of the, of the experiment in which the shocks come on. In black is the control cohort of fish, and in blue is the shocked cohort of fish. And you can see when the shocks come on initially, the control cohort of fish does appear to exhibit an increased response uh, behaviorally in that it is trying to vigorously escape this adversity that has come about. So this is like the active coping phase that I keep talking about. Now, eventually, because the shock don't seize, this takes on the quality of persistent and inescapable stress. And later on in the experiment, as these shocks tend to build up, the shocked fish uh, whip its tail significantly below um, the, that of the, of the control cohort. 
And so the second phase is also manifested behaviorally as the passive coping phase in this particular plot. Now, in addition to tracking behavior with such precision, uh, the Dizeroth lab is also able to express nuclear localized GCAMP in, um, in, in large parts of the larval zebrafish cortex, uh, large parts of the larval zebrafish brain, and image basically every neuron in it while the animal is performing this experiment, um, while the animal's being uh, subject to this experimental behavioral challenge. And so this is what one of those recordings looks like. And so different parts of the, of the fish brain light up at different time points. And since it's nuclear localized GCAMP, we can be relatively sure that this is cellular resolution activity from many regions of the, of the fish brain. And so this is an exquisite data set that we were lucky to get our hands on. It's got about 10,000 to 40,000 units per fish. And we have many fish experiencing these, um, experiencing these shocks relative to control and so on. Right, and so there's a couple of features that pop out of the experiments alone, from the measurements alone. And one of them, because the habenula, as I told you from the beginning of the talk, is a region that is involved in, um, in you know, responses to stress, as well as in these, um, in these types of active and passive coping experiments. Um, Aaron went and looked in the habenula, and indeed, he saw that there was a ramping of activity in the habenula. And so what, that's what I'm showing you here, the little blue highlights where the habenula is in the fish brain. And on the right two panels, I'm showing you the two parts of the habenula. I'm taking the average delta F over F and plotting it as a function of time. Again, control fish are in, in uh, black and gray, and the shocked fish are in blue. And you can see that in the, in the shocked fish, the ventral habenula average activity does appear to ramp uh, from the time of onset of the shock for the duration of the behavioral challenge period. Now, if I, you know, sort of decouple my eyeballs, I can sort of see that in the initial initial part of the shock, by the way, the dashed line is where the shocks start to come on. Uh, there, 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 there could be a little enhancement of activity. There's something that's happening over there, but you know, I'm not you know, totally moved to tears. Really, the trend is that there's a ramping of activity in the ventral habenula. Now, the RAFE nucleus does something slightly different. We know it's downstream of the habenula, typically in, in other studies. And so Aaron looked there, and he found that this, there's a suppression of activity in the, in the RAFE um, that goes along with the ramping of the activity that you see in the ventral habenula. So I'd like to return with those two experimental, just purely experimental findings in hand, I'd like to return to the question that I posed at the beginning of the talk, which is what circuit changes mediate the state transition from active coping to passive coping in the fish? And to get at exactly how these measurements led to the observed behavior, what caused these experimental findings, and what else is going on in the in the rest of the brain? And that's what I mean by when I that's what I mean when I say, well, what circuit changes or what mechanisms, right? That's the kind of understanding I'm after. And so to get at that, my approach is going to be to first build and then reverse engineer a class of networks, a multi-region. Um, recurrent neural network model that is built directly using these time series measurements as constraints. So once I build these networks that are not just data inspired loosely, but directly um, that, that, are, that, are, that are built by using the time series measurements, or in our case, the calcium imaging data directly as constraints, then reverse engineer them to understand things like connectivity principles brain-wide, looking at current flows brain-wide, and so on, stuff that are inaccessible from measurements. And so before I tell you how we do that, let me take a minute, maybe less than that, and tell you what the basic network design elements are that we start with. And then, of course, we toss the whole thing because we're trying to get more biological um, currently. Um, and so, you know, the basic element that I start with, and those of you who've heard, you know, Tim talk would have heard him talk about uh, some of his basic work also in this, um, which is uh, rate-based recurrent neural networks. And I'm talking now about a randomly initialized connectivity. So these are sort of very simplified um, architectures in which uh, you know everything you need to know about the behavior of a network like this, if you knew the firing rate of each element, and if you knew the weights with which each element connects to one another. And so every unit in this network um, operates on a first order differential equation that looks like this, um, which, uh, and it has several components and let me walk you through them really quickly. Uh, these networks can be driven by external inputs. Um, and I've worked on networks like this quite a bit in my PhD and they were all of them were based on randomly initialized connectivity. 
Now, the other key elements in these in networks like this are an activation function or an FI curve or response function, which I'm plotting here, for example, but you can use uh, your favorite nonlinearity. And that's what takes the recurrent currents that each neuron, ex um, neuron experiences and turns them into a firing rate like number or a continuous variable. Uh, the other key element, and I think really the crux of where my talk is going, is this matrix of connectivity, which I'm now keeping general and calling them directed interactions, but they contain the pairwise strengths and the signs or the directions of interactions between all the pairs of neurons in this, in this network. So now that I've said it's randomly initialized, then this matrix, there's just one matrix, which is an N by N matrix with where N, N stands for the number of neurons in this network. And I'm just calling them directed interactions because look, if I were modeling each neuron literally as a biological neuron, then you can take these interaction matrices as the synaptic connectivity matrix, but I'm gonna be building net networks that are based on calcium data. And so I'm only inferring the functional connectivity that is um, the functional connectivity that is manifested in the dynamics that you're able to measure through calcium. And therefore, the, the name directed interaction matrix seem to fit. So in the beginning, we initialize these networks randomly, meaning that this matrix is populated by elements that are drawn from a distribution that looks like this. Now, I'll take this basic architecture as just my starting point, and I throw everything out. I change them in two significant ways. And the first way that I change this is I take one of these, right? This is exactly what I showed you already before. You should see the, 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 the schematic at the top and the directed interaction matrix at the bottom. And I can wire two of these RNNs together, um, making a two region RNN. And now the, the connectivity matrix or the directed interaction matrix acquires a slightly more complex structure where the connections within region one and region two are the, are the blocks that you see on the principal diagonal with the interactions going between these regions off diagonal. I can play this game further and I can attach uh, many regions together like this. And now I'm showing you four in the schematic for argument's sake. And I can build a multi-region RNN and the directed interaction matrix complexifies slightly more where the within region connections are in the four blocks that you see going down the principal diagonal and the off diagonal elements are connections that are going between regions. So networks like this can be used to understand things like within region connectivity, obviously, but also principles of inter-area communication, and in the case of the larval zebrafish, potentially brain-wide, because we have access to about 40,000 units uh, spread across 15 regions or nuclei in the larval zebrafish. So that was the first thing I threw out from the very basic random RNN that I started with. The second thing I throw out is that I take the activity of each unit, which in the beginning is, you know, if I initialize these networks correctly, then is chaotic or is irregular relative to one another. And I can train those outputs, or in this case, the input current to each unit to match directly a target that can be either derived from the calcium data or is literally the calcium data. So every unit in this network or this cartoon that you see here would have started out with a chaotic trajectory and, and goes through a training process at which at every time step, it is matched through a supervised learning rule called RLS or recursively squares to match the calcium data directly. So every unit has a partner unit in the fish and we're just matching the calcium activity and the entire connectivity or the directed interaction matrix potentially brain-wide evolves over time. And that's what I'm showing you here in this delta JIJ term that you see here in this, um, in this, in this little flow chart. And there's been a lot of foundational work which I've cited here. Okay, so this exercise, what does it buy you, right? You're taking every unit in a, in a, in a network that was initially being irregular and pretty complex and training it to match the calcium activity from, from a fish. What does that get you, right? Um, and, and just, and I already told you this, that the number of units in networks like this, at least for today's talk, will be exactly the same as the number of, um, of units that the data come from. So for example, if there's a fish that has 10,000 units that they've provided us data for, then its corresponding RNN will also have 10,000 units. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm putting up there. Um, I have also built a few networks like this um, 
across different data sets. Um, same idea can be used to fit uh, trajectories across behavior. And so there's a couple of papers that I've put up for those of you who wanna um, you know, have a conversation with me afterwards. But this is to say that approaches like this, which is to build networks and fit them directly to the time varying dynamics um, observed experimentally could be powerful. And that's what I'm gonna demonstrate in the rest of the talk. So what does this exercise buy you, right? This exercise buys you three things. One, it buys you a multi-region RNN that produces realistic neural dynamics once trained, right? Once training is taken away, it produces dynamics that looks like the training set. And that alone is not surprising because of course that is what I'm training these networks to do. The really the key here is not the fit, but what you get after you what you get from the fit, right? Which is our ability to look under the hood of these networks, and we can actually infer consistent brain-wide directed interactions, which I'm symbolizing here by J M for model. And so those directed interactions are able to tell us uh, how functional connectivity changes from one condition to the other or through the experiential state within regions as well as between um, as well as um, well both within regions as well as between regions the third thing which i'm going to talk about slightly later in the talk is is the currents due to the recurrence which is directly the dot product of those two objects now the last two you really can't get from measurements alone you can't infer these current uh, the, these these types of interactions from measurements alone and you can't infer these currents which are the product of these two objects uh, within as well as between regions or truly uh, they, these things truly man um, these things you know actually capture directionality of information flow and the magnitude of information flow within and between regions. And so, you know, what does that look like? So let me just, you know, show you what happens if you build a two region RNN. And so here I'm building a neural network that is composed of units that look like the Habenula because they've been trained to match data from the Habenula and then units that match uh, data from the RAFI. I've wired both of them together. Um, and at the bottom of this um, of the slide, you should see the convergence of the learning algorithm. This is just to show you that the algorithm works. I'm showing you the mean squared error between the targets and the, and the, um, and the network's outputs as a function of number of learning steps. And now I'm showing you a couple of example units from the network plotted as a function of time uh, for both the data as well as the model. So this is the delta f over f over time. The first column should be a control condition or the RNNs that are based on data from a control fish. The second column is data from a shocked fish and the model that is built based on data from the shocked fish. In blue is the actual biological data and in red is the model's fit. And you can see that you know these models do actually extremely Extremely well. Now, just to convince you that I'm not cherry picking the six neurons, so on top, by the way, is the ventral habenula, at the bottom is the RAFI. Those are the two key regions that I'm interested in for, for this section. Now, just to convince you that I'm not cherry picking the six neurons in each case that just happen to do the right thing, we can actually project the activity of the entire population of neurons into the state space spanned by the dominant principal components. And that's what you see here for the control condition. So on top is the actual biological data, which I've again projected the calcium activity directly into the three principal components. And at the bottom is the activity of the model, which I'm projecting into its three uh, principal components. This is for the control condition. And you can see the same exists for the shocked condition also. Um, in the shocked condition, I'm showing you also dots uh, symbolizing the times at which the shocks came in for this particular uh, portion of the, um, of the data set. Now, this in and of itself, the fact that it captures essential dynamical features of the population activity is, um, is, is, is while it's really good, um, What's really the key here is the fact that we're able to now look at the directed interactions within the network once it has been trained to match biological data. What I mean by that is now I can look at connections just within the habenula, which is what you should see in the in you know the, the square that's highlighted in red, as well as connections within the RAFE, which is the, the square that's highlighted in green, as well as projections going from the RAFE to the habenula and the connections going from the habenula to the RAFE in the blocks that are. Um, that are up, um, across the principal diagonal. So overall, this matrix does change as a function of experience. So what do you, what I'm plotting now is just the raw histogram of the entire um, of the entire matrix 
from an example fish each, right? One in the control condition and one in the shocked condition as a function of the interaction strengths. I've taken the log of the y-axis because the ranges were kind of enormous. In gray is the histogram from the shocked, um, from the shocked condition or an R, the weights from an RNN that was trained to match data from a control fish. And in blue is an RNN um, fit to match data from a shocked fish. And you can already see that in going from the control fish to the shock, uh, from going from the control condition to the shocked condition, there's a massive expansion in scale. The other thing that should pop out is that there is no significant change in the mean of these distributions. They're both centered more or less at zero. Uh, just for your reference, right, for the random matrix fans um, in, the, in, the, in this audience, uh, the randomly initialized matrix Right? If I plotted the histograms of the random initialized matrix that didn't correspond to data at all, that would be a very, very small blip because it's scaled as, um, it's, its variance is scaled as G squared over N. And so it would be a very small um, U-shaped curve right in the middle of this. So what these graphs tell you are a few things, right? Since the means were both centered at zero were not significant, the key parameter for us to track here were the second moments or the standard deviation, um, other moments such as skewness and kurtosis. In addition, both for the control fish and the shocked fish, the distributions appeared to have heavy tails, which means that rather than being governed by random interactions and small interactions that are scattered throughout the network currently, the, the biggest change drivers appear to be uh, very large, rare synapses. Or in other words, they are synapses that are large, but also relatively infrequent, because remember, the y-axis is going in the log scale. Now, not only can I look at the overall bulk properties of the brain-wide connectivity like this, I can also look within these individual blocks, so I can tell you where do these changes actually come from, right? And so, you know, not entirely surprisingly, I can show you the, the connectivity within the habenula appears to be the biggest change driver. So now I'm plotting the exact same thing, except I'm taking only the elements from the, from the little red square uh, connections within only the habenula. Again, log probability density is plotted as a function of interaction strength and gray is control and blue is shocked. And once again, you see an expansion in the scales or, the, or that the, the synapses appear to strengthen in the shocked conditions relative to the, relative to the control condition. I can look inside the raffe, and in this particular case, you know, I'm not entirely moved to tears, but the change is still consistent with the observed experimental observation that relative to the control condition, the shocked condition does appear to have weaker synapses in the raffe. Um, again, this didn't entirely, you know, convince me of this, but anyway, um, I also looked in connections from that habenula to the raffe, and they were also kind of meh. But then here's the thing that was unexpected that we did that we didn't actually expect to find from um, from measurements alone, because there's very little evidence that there's even an anatomical projection going from the raffe to the habenula. And this is what came out of the network analysis. Now you're looking at the histogram of the weights from the haben from the raffe to the habenula. And there you see a strengthening as well. And this was an unexpected finding. There's, you know, a couple of papers that refer to some kind of indirect non-monosynaptic um, interaction between the raffe and the habenula, but nothing in the zebrafish. And this is, uh, this is a prediction for the experiment that the Dyserroth lab was, uh, was um, performing uh, to verify, to validate the predictions made by this model, you know, right before the COVID crisis. And so the expected uh, finding from the model was that there's strengthening in the connections within the habenula that could potentially explain the ramping of the activity. And then, you know, there was another unexpected finding from the model, which was inaccessible for measurements alone, which is that the connections from the raffe back into the habenula also appeared to strengthen. Now, you know, these findings also were consistent across uh, across networks that were built on data from other fish in these cohorts. So these are, you know, five control fish and five shocked fish that uh, we built networks for. And again, you see that within habenula and the raffe to habenula projection seem to be the biggest change drivers. Habenula to raffe, which is what we actually expected but didn't find. And then the within raffe, they were both not significantly different, even at a population level. 
Right. So that told you that there were, there could be potentially an explanation for why we observed the things we observed experimentally, which is the ramping of the activity in the habenula. And then there was a suppression of activity in the RAFA, but only somewhat, right? But we have data from the whole brain. So what we wanted to do was to say, okay, let's scale up this to a third region or possibly reciprocally connected region and see if, you know, we can disambiguate, you know, effects of common inputs and see, well, what else is changing in the brain or, or is the whole thing being driven just by the habenula and the rafe as we've been um, as we've been expecting to find. And so from that view, we took data from the telencephalon, which you see now here is quite a large region um, in the larval zebrafish. And we built an RNN of these three regions. Again, each of the, each unit is trained to match data from its respective partner region generating the targets. And so in this three region T, uh, model now composes habenula like RNN, a raffi like RNN, and a telencephalon like RNN, all reciprocally connected to one another. Now, again, the same exercise can be played and it produces the same exact three things. The first is dynamic, similar to data, not surprising. Secondly, and I am not going to show you this because, you know, you just have to take my word on it based on what I've just shown you before, which is that we can look at the, that the within region um, connections and the between region directed interactions in the trained overall directed interaction matrix once we're done. But I want to take you in a slightly different direction because, well, A, it's very new and we're very excited about this, which is the possibility to dot the first two objects and produce the look at the recurrent currents, both within and uh, between regions brain-wide. And so that is this object that you see in front of you, which is the sum over, which is the, which is literally the dot product of the matrix and the, and the, and the um, outputs. And so again, just to, just to drive home this point, uh, the first object is the activations that are similar to data. And now we have the directed interaction matrix of the three regions with the columns corresponding to the pre or presynaptic and the rows corresponding to the postsynaptic units. And in the blocks going along the diagonal lie the habenula within habenula connections. The, in green, you should see the within RAFI connections and in blue will be the T lencephalon connections. And the, and the blocks that are across diagonals should be the pairwise um, between region connections going connecting all of these pairs with one another. Now we can dot these two objects to take the dot product of those two objects and look at the currents due to recurrent interactions um, and by, by restricting the sum, right, by restricting what the j, uh, the sum over j sums to, we can look at currents from the same or different areas, right? So we can, for example, look at currents just within the habenula by only restricting the sum to the habenula neurons. We can look at the currents flowing from the raphe into the habenula for, for, the, for, for now, I'm just gonna focus on the habenula because it makes things simpler. Currents flowing from the raphe into the habenula by, by restricting the sum over J to just the green block. I can also look at just the currents flowing from the T lencephalon to the habenula by looking at the blue block. So that's what I'm showing you once again here, which is in orange or red, you should see the habenula to habenula, in green, the raphe to habenula, or in blue, the telencephalon to habenula. Currents. And so what do these currents actually look like? So right now I'm showing you the activity of 2200 habenula units, uh, habenula neurons in um, as a function of time for one example data set, right? And so here on, on top of this plot, I'm also showing you dots which symbolize the time at which shocks appeared. And this is a chunk of the data just for simplicity's sake. These data are also normalized by the mean across this entire population and sorted just for ease of visualization. We're not gonna go any further with the sorting. Just for ease of visualization, sorted by the max on each row. So this is what the habenula to habenula currents look like. The raphe to habenula currents, sorted in exactly the same order as the habenula to habenula currents, look like this. The currents from the T lencephalon to the habenula look like this. So these are all sorted in exactly the same order. When you sum them all together, you should get something that looks like you know what you recorded, but now you're able to decompose these, uh, decompose these, decompose the output into actually the sources, which look like this, right? Now, 
typically when experimentalists perform these experiments and when I build these networks based on experimental or physiological data, right, we do state space analysis and we look at manifolds that span these outputs. And there's many papers that have been written on the subject uh, and, and particularly influential are the Churchill and Cunningham paper, the U paper, Sadler and OB papers. Uh, recently, Matt Perrick joined my lab and he's written a few papers on the subject with his, um, with his collaborators, uh, Juan Gallejo, uh, Lee Miller, and Sarah Soya on looking at manifolds um, in, um, in state space spanned by, by outputs or experimentally observed measurements. Now I'm making the argument that we can do the exact same manifold analysis on the current space. So now that we have the ability to source decompose the output into what the, the currents that came from some other place, we can look at what these activities look like in the state space that is spanned by these currents. So that's what, so looking at those would give you three axes like this, the Habenula to Habenula axis in orange, the Raffi to Habenula axis in green, and the T-lencephalon to Habenula axis in blue. Now, if I take the activity of the, the, if I take the activity as a trajectory, imagine that in the, in projected into the state space that is now spanned by these three current axes, that's what this looks like. So in black is the actual trajectory spanned by the output. And in, um, and you see the dots are now, dots symbolizing the shock times are now colored by whether they came early in the, early in the experiment or corresponded roughly to the active coping phase in warm colors and later in the experiment or colder colors corresponding to what should look like the passive coping phase. And you can kind of see that early on in the experiment, contrary to what we were expecting, it is the, 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 the state space spans Raffi to Habenula first. It's only later on in the experiment that the Habenula to Habenula and Telencephalon to Habenula subspaces even get involved. So contrary to what we were expecting, the early changes seem to be driven by currents going from the Raffi to the Habenula rather than the within Habenula um, connectivity. And so we're now able to look at things like inter-area effects such as timing. I should say that this is still, you know, this is still the starting point for this work and we're, we have a long way to go for this before I can, you know, before I can, you know, uh, make categorical statements about brain-wide state changes. But from, from looking at just three regions or just looking at activity from networks that have been built based on data from three regions alone, we can start to say, okay, the early changes or the active coping may be actually influenced by currents in the Raffi to Habenula subspace. And the later, it's only later on in the experiment, or as you see on the right, the behavioral, uh, behavioral plot, which I've already shown you, the passive coping or the decline in movement could involve the habenula to habenula or the telencephalon to the habenula uh, currents. I think that this way of looking at currents or state spaces or manifolds spanned by these currents is a, in my view, a slightly more informative or at least a complement to more traditional ways of looking at activity. So, you know, you can look at just the activity of the habenula neurons plotted as a function of time. You can look at the average population activity, also something you've seen before in this talk, um, as a function of time. Or you can look at, you know, just experimental data projected into the state space spanned by the dominant principal components of the habenular activity. And there again, you don't see this clear separation of these of these two early and late effects you kind of see this you know trajectory spanning this um, spanning this piece principal component space smoothly so what do these act what do these trajectories look like right like what do the actual current manifold trajectories look like and so that's what i'm plotting here so input current so what i'm plotting here is the current in principal component space the first principal component as a function of time now in gray is actually the movement so what i'm taking is the vector uh, matt and i took the vector of tail whips and we convolved it with the gaussian just to give you for ease of visualization a continuous trace and this basically indicates that in the control fish, the tail whips don't exactly, uh, you know, slow down over time. It just is continuous. It continues through the experiment. And in green is the raffi to habenula. In orange is the habenula to habenula. And in blue is the telencephalon to the habenula currents plotted as a function of time. And, you know, they don't look that different, especially when you compare them with the exact same thing plotted from an example shocked fish. So once again, it's the first principal component plotted as a function of time. Here, of course, the movement um, 
that you see in gray slows down some point in the middle, right? And then this fish really, so I'm not cherry picking a fish here again, right? It's a randomly picked one. And this fish does make an exploratory tail whip even after the after its lapse into passivity, as you see in the gray bump at the at the end. Now, what, what is interesting here, and you can see the shock times uh, marked by early and late in the dots on top. Interestingly, it's the raffi to habenula currents that ramp up rather early in the experiment that correspond to the active coping phase, uh, which is consistent with the, with the plot that you see on top. And it's only later on, it's only after the movements have largely ceased or gone into passive coping that the habenula to habenula and the telencephalon to habenula currents start to ramp. So the ramp in the, the initial part is driven by or the active coping is driven by currents from the raffi to the habenula picking up. And this trend holds even after you average these findings across networks that have been built based on data from multiple fish in each cohort. So again, on the left, you see the movement um, of a control fish overlaid with these three currents. Again, in green is raffi to habenula, the orange is habenula to habenula, and blue is telencephalon to habenula. And the three kind of mirror each other in the control fish. However, in the shocked fish, there's an early separation between the three in that the raffi to habenula seems to engage first and corresponds to the vigorous or increase in uh, tail movements in the first part of the experiment. And it's only later after passivity that the habenula to habenula and the telencephalon to habenula currents even start to get engaged or ramp up. Now we're still investigating what happens in these other regions, but to really convince you that there are these two time scales that are involved, I want to bring back a plot. Um, I've replotted it in, in similar colors to the second part of the talk here, but this is the log probability density as a function of interaction strengths for the sub matrix corresponding to the just the raffi to habenula for the simplicity's sake, right? So what I've just told you is that in the shock condition, the active coping phase or the early change changes are driven by currents rotating in the raffi to the habenula subspace. And to really convince you of that, I have to show you also that there is no concomitant change in the connectivity in the raffi to habenula early in the experiment. And that's what the, the histogram on the left shows you. In gray is um, baseline, and in red, the, the red histogram is a histogram collected from a, from a network that was trained to match the early part of the experiment. And you see that the gray and the red are very similar to each other, showing that the early part doesn't involve brain-wide connectivity or directed interaction change. Meanwhile, later on in the experiment, the blue histogram does show a widening. Um, corresponding to connectivity changes. So there seem to be these two separate things going on, active coping driven by rapid or early time scale rotations in the raffi to habenula subspace, and later changes probably driven by brain-wide connectivity or plasticity mechanisms that change things like directed interactions in the raffi to habenula subspace. And so this is exactly the same thing that I've just told you before. I've just taken it to the top of the top of the slide. And so to return to the question that I posed before, what circuit changes mediate the state transition from active coping to passive coping in the fish? I have offered you today two preliminary answers that are based on uh, theory um, that we couldn't have accessed from measurements alone. The first is that habenular interactions uh, strengthen with persistent inescapable adversity, which is what I showed you in the first part of the talk. It's also consistent with measurements showing the habenular activity ramping up. Uh, we also found an unexpected connection from the raffi feeding back to the habenula. Those seem to strengthen also. In the second part, I introduced this currents-based decomposition that we're working on as a method paper and we're hoping to provide to the community for testing on, you know, various other data sets, um, is, is that it reveals these, you know, different sources or different roles of raffi and telencephalon projections into the habenula, some of which are driven by fast changes in the current, such as a raffi to habenula mediating the early experiment, early or active coping phase, and some by slower connectivity changes.
So to conclude, um, you know, in this in this talk is, is exactly what I told you before, is that we're able to build these multi-region RNN models that are able to generate dynamics that are similar to experimental data. We can constrain them with, ex, uh, with uh, physiological and behavioral data simultaneously. Uh, we can infer consistent directed interaction matrices, which is um, which can reflect both inter and both intra and inter area connectivity, and they correlate with behavioral state change. We are uh, working on this current based decomposition analysis that separate uh, not just the sources from which these currents into a particular region come from, but they can also separate the time scales at which these processes operate. Um, and so I've presented preliminary results from the habenula raphe and the telencephalon, but we are in the lab currently analyzing these things brain-wide across 15 regions. So what we're trying to do as a lab is to provide um, these types of RNNs that are constrained by experimental measurements directly right from the outset as, an, as a viable alternative or a complement to more traditional correlation-based functional connectivity analysis. And so with that, I'd like to thank um, the people in the lab, as well as people in the Dyes-Roth lab, particularly Matt Perrick and uh, Camille Spencer-Salmon, both of whom you see here. Matt's on the job market, um, and he's basically a rock star. Um, so, and also we're hiring um, pretty aggressively, so despite the times, and I hope you'll consider us if you are on the job market. And, and I would like to thank my funding sources, and uh, I'd like to, you know, a little shout out to my mother who, uh, would have liked to see this today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tanaka, for coming and uh, talking to us today. Uh, I have made it possible for all of you to unmute your microphones yourself if you want to ask any questions. This is your chance. Hi, it's Matteo Carandini. Can I ask a Thank question? You. How are you? Yes. Hi. It was an amazing talk. I loved it. It's one of the good things of this quarantine that I got to see your talk. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Very kind. Um, I, I'm itching to use similar methods for data from lots of neurons in cortex. And I have a question. Yes. In, the, in the matrix of JIJs that you got from this fish, um, you ended up with a beautiful um, squ um, square um, square looking matrix with square that intersected each other and each square corresponds to a brain region and the intersection is the communications between the brain regions. Yes. Two questions. Number one, did you impose this squarish nature or did it come out of the data? And number two, how different would a simple matrix of correlations be from such a matrix? Uh, two questions, both of whom are, are um, more, you know, nuanced than I can do them justice uh, here. But uh, but the first, the answer to the first one is no, we did not impose this low rank. So what we expect is that the blocks are blocks along the diagonal should be full rank, and the blocks across the diagonal should be low rank. We have not currently imposed this, nor have they fallen out of the data explicitly, but only because we haven't been able to probe rank in a more uh, systematic way. What we should really be doing is to restrict the plasticity rule. What we should be doing is to say that if you are a weight that belongs on the diagonal or along the diagonal in the band, then you change everybody, but impose the plasticity to be sparse across the diagonals and see what the network pops out as a probability of connections going from region A to region B or region B to region C. So that's the answer to the first one. We haven't, we should, sort of the the project for the, for the next time we're in quarantine, I suppose. Um, the second thing is that um, the, okay, so the, the functional connectivity matrix, the traditional activity matrix is the covariance matrix of the, let's say the matrix is, uh, you know, N neurons by time, right? Like I was at Nick Steinmetz's cosine talk and we had uh, discussions about using this method actually. It was very, very kind and generous. Um, but that would be basically constructing an N by N matrix of the firing rates of the, or, or the activities or, you know, calcium imaging data directly. That is one N by N matrix. The N by N matrix that we are extracting from these networks is a fit to the entire dynamical system. And so that is the JIJ matrix. Now, knowing the JIJ, and knowing the external inputs, you can construct the full functional connectivity matrix that you're describing, which is the covariance matrix of the activity. 
The reverse is not necessarily true. This is like a holy grail problem, right? Like how do you go from the J matrix to the covariance matrix and how do you invert that problem? This is not an invertible problem, but we're, you know, every day inching slightly closer and closer. So that's the non-flippant answer. Now here's the flippant answer. Looking at just covariance of activities, you miss a few things. For example, directionality of information flow between regions, right? It's just a pairwise multiplication. So you're missing if information is flowing from A to B or B to A, that you're missing. The second thing you're missing in traditional correlation matrices is um, common inputs. So let's say the T lencephalon in the, in the talk that I gave you was the thing that was driving both Habenila and Raffae. You would kind of look at them as correlations, but you wouldn't be able to tell me if the directionality was one way or or if it was driven by common inputs, or that, or that Habenula and Rafi were literally connected to one another. That's why I'm proposing this as an alternative. So, but yes, I mean, your data set would be basically a goldmine for something like this. Um, Tanaka, can I ask a uh, very nice talk? Thank you. Um, one thing that I'm, I was wondering about is, it seems like often with these large recurrent networks, you um, you actually have a giant space of networks which do very similar things. I mean, at a minimum, you could permute hidden neurons, although you know that, that wouldn't be a very interesting transformation. But what I'm wondering is, you know, if you train, if you apply these methods again and again to the same data set, starting from very different initializations, do you basically recover the same thing every time, or do you think there's really a space of possibilities? that this method um, that would be consistent it's with your data? Extremely, extremely good, um, good question. I mean, honestly, this is not, I mean, if I were to say like, look, the brain literally uses RLS and literally produces this connectivity, uh, I, I'd be completely insane. I'm saying that, you know, even if we start from five or six different initial random matrices of connectivity, we do get consistent um, properties of these matrices. So the findings that I'm showing you today would be consistent even if I started from different initial conditions. Now, if you're asking about slightly broader universality, for example, how sensitive would this be to me uh, using dropout or me training these networks using reinforcement learning and things like that? The jury's out on that, we don't know. We just don't know. So there is the whole like industry of, you know, let's just, you know, use backprop and hope and pray we find a line attractor and state space approach, which is incredibly, incredibly fruitful. But then what we're going in is, uh, is sort of orthogonally, we're saying that if we build networks that are constrained more and more by, well, the only ground truth we have are experimental measurements, right? So if we build networks that are either mimicking the training process or mimicking the actual activity that is observed, then there's less hope and prayer in the space of solutions. Then there's the philosophical answer to yours, right? Which is actually inspired by something that uh, Dan Yaman said to me a while ago, which is like, you know, if the task is simple or the thing that you're getting the network to do is simple, then the class of solutions is enormous. But then if you start to complexify by putting more and more constraints, right? Then the space of solutions should shrink. There, there's no, I mean, I, sounds good, right? This, philosophy sounds good. So I'm saying that yes, in our hands, starting from different initial conditions, you get consistent inference. More constraints that are inspired by biology, the better it is. But beyond that, any claims of universality are just lies. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, hi, Tanaka. Hi. Thank you for uh, the talk. It's really great, very beautiful. Uh, I really loved actually the definition of directed interaction matrix. It really puts things to place in the whole debate between uh, for deep neural networks and um, that you call it for functional connectivity. So I'd, maybe I missed it, but could you say, did, did, do you consider of, of looking at actual anatomy and how things uh, are connected uh, uh, biologically and see how from the biological and anatomical, get this in, uh, intera direct interaction matrix. It's a very, very good question. So the, the, you know, the thing that the, so even in our work, right, these connections that seem to strengthen in the submatrix spanned by the Raffae to the Habenula directed interactions, right? Those weights are not a known anatomical connection in the fish. 
right? At least not a known monosynaptic anatomical connection. That is not to say, so the dorsal raphe nucleus dumps a bunch of serotonin into the system and says, I hope you feel better, right? That's its job. So it's possible that there are long range interactions that the network's spitting out that don't correspond to anatomical projections. That said, what, what Matt and I are doing now is to train a much smaller network. So this is now again inspired by Eve Marder. I think basically everything we've done is inspired by stuff that Eve would have kind of said. You know, so one thing we're doing now is to do the same currents based decomposition on C elegance, right? Let's go yeah. even smaller. I'm going to do a 302 neuron network, train them to match the activity that, uh, you know, several labs have recorded while these, while these worms are wiggling around, and then see if I can recover something that has any connection to its known comic form. Uh, but, you know, one prediction that these networks can make is, you know, instead of being driven by, you know, smaller connections scattered throughout the network, there, are, there is evidence of very large synapses. And so one could do something like Mersich Flogel's brilliant experiments, right, and go look for these large synapses to verify the prediction, to say that network tuning is governed by rare big synapses rather than a ton of recurrent changes everywhere. So there's a few ways in which we can push this. But connecting, I think that connecting uh, what we're saying, the directed interactions that I'm inferring to yeah. the actual anatomical connectome, we are decades away. I think that's a missing, the still missing part, no? Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hi, Kanika. My name is Chaitanya. I'm a postdoc with Tim. I really like your talk. I was uh, wondering about uh, this uh, synaptic currents that you were explaining between uh, that's, that's sort of driving each of these regions, right? Have you looked further into this? Are these like balanced or like, is it in, is there some interplay between inhibitory and excitatory? Or? We can separate them. So it's a very, very good question and extremely good eye. I mean, you're the only one who's asked me this so far. We, so, you know, what we're doing right now is basically taking the absolute value of the J matrix, the entire matrix, and then multiplying it with the outputs because I wanted to make these uh, just to look for gross trends. But remember the J, the interaction matrix comes with signs. So I can separate the excitatory and inhibitory influences of these currents separately. And that's something that we're currently working on. So extremely good idea, should do it, haven't done it yet. So uh, le let me just get a clarification. So you're saying that the J matrix that you're taking, you're taking the absolute values. The in, in the graphs that I showed you today, yeah. So it's, it's the magnitude of the synaptic yeah. input. I'm point. only looking at the overall magnitude. So we can okay. separate them into excitatory alone elements and inhibitory alone elements, and then produce excitatory currents and inhibitory sure. current manifolds. Got and so that's Thank something you. that we need to do. We haven't. Preliminarily, the you know, one or two graphs that I've seen, and again, like don't quote me on this if I take it all back in the next 10 minutes, is that you know, they don't look balanced for now. Thank you. Cheers. Welcome. I see no other unmuted microphones, so I uh, will conclude this again. Uh, before we thank Kanaka again for coming, and I'll unmute all your microphones so you can clap. Uh, I wanted to let you know that Kanaka also has time for some one-on-ones. Um, I already have some arranged, but if you would like to meet Kanaka without the rest of the audience. Uh, do stay uh, after the end of her talk. Thank you very much, Kanaka, for coming. Um, Thank you for your lovely talk. <laughs>